Hi everybody, this is Patrick McCarthy reporting with Tri-Cities Community Television for our municipal update for 2022. Uh, election day, of course, is October 15, and we are on the unceded territory of the Quaquitlam First Nations, and I uh, want to thank them for allowing us to volunteer and do the work we do here on Tri-Cities Community Television on their space. Uh, today we have uh, a councillor from the city of Coquitlam, Councillor Terry Towner. Welcome to the show. And first of all, thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. I think the last time uh, we interviewed you, you were doing your kind of run every street or something. I, I said, well, you could just jump into one of those garbage trucks and ride every street. So that's <laughs> yes. what I would have done. So tell us, <laughs> tell us what's happened the last four, this last four years and, and, and kind of how COVID, I think, as a council person has kind of... Uh, uh, impacted you or even the city itself? What I would say we got out of COVID is you really learn when you need to be resilient, when you have to be responsive, um, kind of, I've l learned that we have to learn to expect the unexpected, be prepared, know how to pivot. Those sound like all the buzzwords that we were using, but we really truly had to reprioritize what our residents needed. And I'm, I'm actually really proud of the way we did it. We were one of the first municipalities to start reopening up the facilities in a very, you know, COVID friendly way, but, but when we were given the green light too. And our community response support program, you know, really helped out the nonprofits and the more vulnerable populations in our city. And then we were recognized with an award from the UBCM in our community response. but. I just, it really emphasized to me that, you know, we're all just doing our thing, trying to make the world a better place. And we have to work together to support each other. We weren't all in it together. No. Everybody, we were all in it, but everybody's, what's that expression? You know, mm. that we're same. in the same boat, but some people's yeah. boats, you know, had holes and they were leaking and they only had yeah. one or, whatever that analogy is, sorry, I can't remember it, but it really, really emphasized to me that we get more done when we support each other, work together, and just overcome the obstacles when they come our way. Yeah, so, so how, how bizarre, I know, I know, you know, for, for myself, you know, when you have your, your day job and, and you've got, you know, the, the sort of COVID comes and they say, you know, okay, tomorrow to get your test or you can't go to work today or something and that pivot, um, as a council woman, what, what did, what was that first, you know, first thought when all of a sudden you thought, oh, oh crap, well, you know, we're, this is going to change my world for, for you personally, but for the city. I'm just, just curious that, you know, did you get a call from, from the mayor or did you guys all show up and, and do a Zoom call? I mean, just a kind of sense of how that kind of went from zero to 100 really quickly. It did happen very quickly. And I had, was just coming out of surgery. So I was recovering and it all, everything shut down. But I don't really think I focused too much on myself. Mm. I focused on who I could help and who I could reach out to, the vulnerable people in my family, in my neighborhood, the residents, and what can I do to help whoever needs it get through this. Mm. For, so, uh, you know, the city's changing, so we know there's a lot more people moving into Coquitlam or even this region. So for folks who are new to this area and may not know who you are, even they may see your name on council, like could just give us a sense of uh, who you are and what you stand for. That would, that would be appreciated for those new folks in town. Okay, well, I was born and raised in Burnaby, not too far from here, but I say that I've lived my entire adult life in Coquitlam. And I've always, always, since I was a teenager, wanted to be part of the solution. I've always been action oriented. I've always had lots of energy and never been one to sit in front of the TV. So I was always out in my community trying to make a difference. And then I had an amazing career in a, in a corporate role in human resources for 17 years and I got reorganized out of it, out of that role. And, uh, and then an opportunity came that I didn't see to run in a by-election back in 2013. Two of the female councillors became MLAs, so there was two seats. And I was approached by people in the community to run on council, to you know represent people, and uh, I, at first I said, no, I'm not a politician. But then I realized I love to serve my community. So I ran in 2013, didn't get elected, but I realized I loved talking to people on the doorsteps and hearing what their concerns were, hearing what their issues were, and learning about what we could do, what the city could do to help. 
So you don't. So I guess you're a person that doesn't like to. It sounds like you're very. You have a very. Uh, you you kind of can't sit still too long. Well, I I was approached to run, and I was like, I'm not a politician. Yeah. Right. And then I was encouraged enough that I ran, and I loved, I loved hearing from the residents in Coquitlam. Mm. And then I tried again in 2014, and it truly has been my honor and my privilege to be a city councilor for the last two terms. Yeah. And I'm actually really proud of some of the stuff. Um, I'm proud on numerous levels, the big picture level as far as Coquitlam staff, Coquitlam management, Coquitlam council, some of the things that we've accomplished and overcome in my two terms on council. But I'm also quite um, proud of some of the initiatives that I've spearheaded and the things I've accomplished as a city councillor during my time on council. And, when, and those would be? Well, just recently. You've got uh, me interested. I just okay. I, I saw you lay it out for me and I responded. A, a couple of <laughs> examples. Just recently, I mean, I just said I like to take action and be solutions oriented. I was scrolling Instagram uh, earlier this year, maybe last year, and I saw a post by our Coquitlam firefighters that they were fighting a residential fire just over here. And during the active fire scene, a resident drove over the fire hose that was filled with water. And because of the pressure, it damaged the fire hose, put holes in it, and of course stopped working, which is a major safety issue. And it damaged the hose. So one, unnecessary tax dollars spent to replace the hose. But two, driving over a fire hose can have catastrophic consequences. Not only, if it, what if it cuts the water supply off right when the firefighter is putting out a fire and there's a, someone in the structure right there and all of a sudden the fire is cut off? Or what if it's laying down and the, fire start, the hose starts to fly around and it's got the coupling on and it hits someone? So anyways, I thought, that's wrong. And the violation in the Motor Vehicle Act for that is $76 or something. Whereas picking, touching your phone at a train is 368 but the level of catastrophic consequences doesn't even compare so just last week up at ubcm i'd put a motion forward to ask the province to look at the motor vehicle act to make that more severe because i did some research and that happens in other municipalities people just drive through fire scenes and drive over the hoses so i really think we could do a better part in making the public aware please don't drive over fire hoses when they're in use mm but also by upping the fine so people realize that that can have catastrophic consequences. Another, t another thing that I'm happy about is a resident, so some parts of our city getting more populated, getting denser. And is, we that have a, is that a good thing? Well, yes and yes, we do need more housing. We, I've talked to our Minister of Federal Immigration, and yeah, immigration numbers are huge. There, there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people coming to Canada. There's a bottleneck or a retroactive amount of people coming because of the pause during the COVID. And it's good that people are living longer. But I also read an interesting report that fewer people are getting married. So whereby in the past, maybe those two people would have been one house, now they're two, and things like that. So our need for housing is drastically increasing and we have to meet that supply. So. Yes, it's a good thing because we need housing and we need people to work and it's good that people are living longer, but it is a challenge to address these housing needs and balance preserving and respecting what's here now, preserving the character of our neighborhoods and our tree canopy and having enough amenities and all that kind of stuff. So it is a challenge. But just back to the whole dense neighborhood thing and we all have to live together, there was a tenant, a lot of um, houses have secondary suites, which again is good, it's mortgage helper, helps affordability and provides rental for people who need rental. But a lot of landlords don't let their tenants smoke inside their suite. And what this one group of residents was finding is there was a couple of tenants so they would sit in their car in the cul-de-sac for hours on end and smoke in their car, but they would idle. And then meanwhile, the windows are open and the kids are playing and they're breathing in all this exhaust. 
And so I looked into it and we didn't have a bylaw for idling. And then I found out that there's a whole bunch of idling issues that happen in our city. Some idling is necessary, sitting in traffic during an emergency, things like that. But there was a lot of idling going on that was affecting the quality of life of the people that had to breathe it in and it wasn't necessary. And so I had an anti-idling bylaw supported by council and implemented this year. So it doesn't mean that we drive around the city with a stopwatch, you know, looking for people with their cars running when they're not moving. What it means is bringing awareness, please don't use your cars to, and, and also when I was running every street during the pandemic, I saw a lot of cars sitting with no human inside them with, the, with running. Mm. In the winter, people would leave the car running while they ran errands to keep the, the car warm. Yeah, cool. And, and in the summer, they would keep it running to keep it cool. Right? I saw that a lot. Mm. And I see it at Como Lake Village. People leave their cars running. That's one thing if they're EVs, but if they're regular vehicles and they're spewing exhaust and you're doing a 20-minute shopping errand, everybody else has to breathe that in. Yeah. So I could give you other examples too, but I just like to look at the reason and, and try to see if we can make the, the world a little more livable for everybody else that we're sharing it with. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't, uh, like I said, I mean, running every street, I was being a bit flippant. I mean, I mean, like I said, you could jump on a, on a, on a garbage truck and, and drive every street. But I think the, you know, the idea of, of seeing every street is probably the more important part of just ground level and sort of seeing what's happening in the community. So can I add on that? Sure, you can. I only, I started running every street for my own personal health reasons. Yeah. I love to I run. Should do, I should do that. <laughs> I love to run. <laughs> you have to love to run though. And there was a woman in Poco that did it, all Poco Street. She couldn't yeah. go run the marathon because of COVID and it inspired me. Mm. So I thought I should run Coquitlam. And I completely embarked on that challenge to run every meter of every street in Coquitlam just for my own personal my own personal challenge. Mm. However, I couldn't seem to take off my city councillor hat. Yeah. And while I was running, I did notice illegal dumping, lighting issues, visibility issues, um, parking challenges, signage that could be improved, all sorts of things like that. And I brought those concerns back to the council table or to our engineering and public works department. And I had quite a few things fixed. Yeah. And even though that wasn't my goal to go out there and do it for that, again, I like to, I like to be solutions oriented from the, from the angle of serving the public. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's good to make change happen and be part of positive change, yeah. even if they're just little things. Yeah, I, th I think if I was in charge of engineering, I'd find out what your route is and have a team moving ahead of you the day before just to... You know, I kept it random. Put plastic flowers in the right places <laughs> and smiling of, people waving at you. Totally. And, yeah, yeah, I would have done that. Um, but so, so one of the big challenges um, is affordable housing. You know, we, we, we know that Coquitlam received good, good sort of, you know, a, a tip of the hat from the UBCM. But just really, uh, what would you say to those young folks who, whose parents are probably sold their place and about to leave Coquitlam? Um, or kicking them out because uh, of whatever reason, but but they're you know they're seventy five thousand. They always say is a mean average. You know thirty percent of your income should be for that. So what do you say to a young couple, a young person who wants to live in Coquitlam uh, and is feeling that they can't? I know it's a challenge. I have a twenty year old and an eighteen year old. I would love for them to be able to stay in Coquitlam. So I'm hoping that with increasing supply, the price will come down. I mean, I've heard stories that, you know, someone advertises their unit for rent and they get 500 interested parties in a, we in a weekend right. that wants to rent their unit. So they take the post down, add $800 a month to the rent and put it back up. And now they only get 250 interested people. So when there's not enough supply, price goes up. And I know that's very simplistic. I'm hoping that with the, with tr SkyTrain coming to Coquitlam, and us densifying around the SkyTrain corridors, supply will increase. Um, but it just, it kills me that people of regular means may not be able to stay in Coquitlam or never own. So we have to keep being creative with our land use. Yes, we have to have neighborhoods that are single family, 
we have to have neighborhoods that are large single family with big yards because there is a segment of the population that wants that. But there are many neighborhoods that we could use the land a lot better. It's close to transit. It's you know, people don't even need to have a car. That helps with affordability. If we can build housing within walking to rapid transit so people can save that 10 or 12,000 a year not having a car, put lots of car share programs in the area, e-mobility and make it really easy to get around without a car and live in a transit oriented area. That's one way to stay. But we have to keep increasing rental. We have to keep increasing units for seniors to downsize into. We have to have good policies for landlords so they don't pull out of the rental market. That's an unintended consequence is when you give, when you take away the rights of landlords, they pull out of rental housing. So, and that's kind of a provincial thing, but we have to do what we can to keep it so landlords keep their rental in the rental pool. And I would just tell, tell the youngsters to get a roommate, try to save up part of your income, live with mom and dad as long as you can. No. Uh, I don't know, I'm not gonna say move to Alberta, like the, the ads, but I just... But don't you think, Bill, it's kind of the catch-22. You want someone to work in a coffee shop. I know. So you're, 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 yeah, I think the city has a livable wage. You know, I, I can guess the livable wage is 20, north of $25. I think you get some, some cities have a livable wage, uh, hourly wage. Right? So um, you've got people on average income is $75,000, right? 30% of your house is supposed to go to your rent or mortgage. Like when you start putting the numbers on the table, um, yeah. Go to the right side. So just curious what your thoughts about that are. We just have to keep doing what we, we have to keep getting creative, keep looking for partnerships. We have to just keep looking for other ways of affordability, yeah. child care that's available, transit oriented development, affordable recreation programs, because we don't want people to just spend their whole paycheck on housing, right? We have to keep doing what we're doing. It's really hard in a market economy though, I mean, I just bought my house, and it's ridiculous what it's appraised at. Yeah, it's a bit ridiculous. So, so what is the, the the two you know tougher questions is like what? So, what is the city doing with this massive growth in towers? Like, it's part of the OCP from a few years ago, but right now we're going to see towers in Coquitlam Center, and we're going to see Millardville is going to have some tower growth. So, what is the city doing to kind of ensure that there's affordability in that mix? Well, we're advocating for partners. Our housing affordability strategy has been extremely successful. I think in 40 years, no, nobody built rental in Coquitlam for 40 years because the federal government and the provincial government, whose mandate is housing, pulled out the different incentive programs and the, the different programs that spurred on rental, they pulled out. So that's why we only have really old rental buildings or now brand new. So we have to keep looking for these partnerships, nonprofits, the federal government, the provincial government, keep building market and rental and below market rental any and or below yeah, below market rental and non market rental. Yeah. We have to keep getting some of each of these types of housing types in every development. Every single one. Accessible units for people in our population that need accessible units, units that have no stairs and all that for senior citizens who want to stay living independently. We just have to keep advocating for getting these units in all of these developments. They can't all be market. Yeah, I guess I, mean, I would agree with you, but I guess in the other part would be, you know, people talk about supply and demand, which you just you touched on, but I mean, uh, demand is, is not just the people who are, you know, my kids living in with me that want a place. It's, <laughs> it's you know, it's people migra you know, immigrating here, which is, which is fine, but it's also an investment component to this, right? So, so what can the city do to kind of um, temper that the, the demand or the supply goes to the right demand? You know, the citizens who may have lived here for many years, or is there a way of doing something with, with developers to make sure it's, it's fair and equitable for? this the people coming into this space or, or I don't think we can temper demand and like I said I've talked to the Minister of Immigration because I do a lot of work assisting newcomers and refugees so mm -hmm. I'm quite dialed into that whole process and when the 400 and something thousand immigrants come in every year 
they basically, the majority of them choose the greater Toronto area and the greater Vancouver area. Then when they get to greater Vancouver, they narrow it down and a lot of them come to the Tri-Cities. And that's because, look at it, it's a beautiful place to live. We have transit and mountains and rivers and lakes and it's beautiful and we have a strong community spirit. And yes, it's expensive. It's horribly expensive to live in Metro Vancouver. But people are coming and I don't think we can temper demand. I mean, there's a whole bunch of small towns in northern BC that hundreds of thousands of people aren't flocking to every month. No offense to those towns, but I, I don't want to change it so we're not attractive mm. and not livable and people don't want to live here. Yeah, I so think, I don't I think, think we can temper. People say, well, quit building things and then people will quit coming. Well, that's not true. They're coming. Oh, yeah, they're coming. I, I agree yeah. with you there. But I guess the way I look at it is, and it's just, I'm seeing it in my in my world, you know, I've got, uh, we've got people who are volunteered on Tri-Cities Community Television who are selling their house and moving. Yeah. Uh, we've got, you know, people in my family are moving into the interior. So um, there's this kind of, I call cashing out mentality mm -hmm. where you, you know, I've sat on my ass for, for 20 years and my house is worth a lot, I could cash out, but, but where are my kids gonna go? So it's kind of like, um, to me, it's like we're, we're kind of, our communities are changing the, in not in a legacy sense. It's almost like we're losing that, that sort of institutional knowledge. And I'm just curious what you think about that, or am I off my rocker here? Well, I'd like to talk about something else other than this, because I'm sure, you know, everybody else has talked about this. Well, I don't, but, well some people have brought, no, I think it's kind of, um, in details, is, details is the best part. I know, right? but it's, it's market. I've talked to people who say, but doesn't it worry you that when you San Francisco, London, New York, Paris never yeah. used to be as expensive as they are. Yeah. Vancouver is on the Pacific Rim. It's right on the ocean. It's beautiful. It's landlocked. We have a border, ALR, mountains and ocean. So sure. we have no more land. So we're landlocked and it's people are coming. So we have to densify and supply and demand. It's but the, those cities there that I listed never used to be as expensive as they are. And now nobody blinks when, when you say, oh, I can't afford to live in San Francisco or London or Paris because they're world-class cities. And I've heard some demographers say that we're just in the prepubescent stage of becoming the world-class city. And it, it's, I mean, I hope it doesn't happen mm -hmm. where the prices just keep going up the market. Uh, like I said, my house is now it's 10 times more than what I paid for it or seven times more. And I only bought it 20 years ago. Right. It's ridiculous. Um, but it's the market. There's nobody on earth who can change that one person. So I'm not going to sit here and say, I'm going to solve that because it's really complicated. There's no simple solution to a really complicated situation. I hate the fact that it's expensive to live here, but I'm proud of the fact that rather than throwing my hands up or, or anybody else who's doing all this, throwing their hands up and saying, oh, well, we're on our way to being the next San Francisco. We're trying, we're reaching out for partnerships, we're talking to the feds and the provincial people in charge, we're advocating for more, we're doing what we can to use the land the most effectively that we can, get people alternate transportation options, childcare options. We have got 10,000 units in stream that we, and there was zero before, zero. The next uh, thing is we talk about the environment, or I guess, I guess the last few, few weeks or months or, or years, you've had floods, fires, a whole bunch of stuff has happened. So what's your views on what's gonna happen in the, uh, or the city of Coquitlam needs to do to address those kind of challenges? I'm currently the chair of the Sustainability and Environment Committee. Uh, we meet again next week, and I'm really appreciative of the volunteers that serve on that committee. But I'm proud that the city of Coquitlam has, just this year, we approved our environmental sustainability plan, and we acknowledge that climate change is real. We want to mitigate climate change as much as we can. And I'm really, really on board with, again, being solutions oriented, doing what we can. So I'll just give you a couple of examples. Having all new developments um, EV ready. A lot of people want to buy an, uh, an electric vehicle, but they live in an older condo and they can't charge it. So any new multifamily for a couple of years now being built EV ready. And then more and more chargers are going up all throughout Coquitlam. I want to have more cycling infrastructure. 
Five years ago, I might not have said that because I talked to a lot of people who don't want to ride their bikes in Coquitlam because it's too hilly. I ran every street. I know how hilly it is. However, there's an advent of e-bikes now. I bought myself an e-bike. I use it to commute from south of Mundy Park to City Hall and back. Chilco, Mariner, they're very hilly, but it's feasible. So I want to make our city safe and accessible with secure storage. So anybody who wants to embrace e-mobility to get out of their car for their errands, do that. Our tree canopy, we uh, normally plant about 5,000 trees every year. We're on track to plant 10,000 this year. And there's more, water conservation and you know mitigation for various, you know, getting ready for the heat domes. I'm really proud of all that. And I really looking forward to if I get reelected next term. I want it to be as easy as possible and as safe as possible for anybody in our city to embrace the e-mobility options including e-bikes, e-scooters, we're looking into all sorts of options for people to not have to use your, their car and then they have options for that first mile, last mile to and from rapid transit. We're also advocating for green building and lots of other environmental creativities and initiatives that we can do to make our footprint less. Yeah, because I think the city is going to do a, you guys have a very tight uh, timeline and commitment, so I guess in a sense, you're going to lead, try to lead the way, I guess. I really would like, if I get reelected, I would just love to be a part of all that's ahead in addressing, mitigating climate change, taking action, preserving our environment, mm. getting more trees, more green buildings, less cars. Mm. So, I, I, and on the bike side, is, is I got, you know, my wife has an e-bike and we also walk, but it seems like the, you know, e-bikes are great, but there is some kind of, on some trails, you know, these bikes can hit some very fast, paces so I, I, I hope that you know in Vancouver we have some segmentation thing I just it's almost like we need speed limit on our trails you you right you walk the dike and it's like uh, you know the bikes are going 30 40 clicks so what's your thoughts on that I agree with you uh, whenever I use my e-bike if I'm on the MUP the multi-use pathway I ring my bell when I'm coming up behind people and because of all the running I've done and do it terrifies me when someone comes speeding up behind me at 30 I think e-bikes max out at 32 k an hour but still that's fast you can play with them a bit i i don't know how to do that, anyway but, i don't know that. but but you know one thing i learned within maybe six months of first getting elected the number one thing or reason of emails coming into the city or to me as a counselor was other residents complaining about the behavior of other residents mm. People on e-bikes, speeders, people who've tossed their mattress into the ravine, people who speed, people who rat run, people who flick their cigarette butts in the... I mean, it's all... The laws are there, the bylaws are there, but it's people complaining about the behavior of other people. So, yes, I'm advocating for e-mobility and e-bikes, and yes, the rules will be put in place, but at the end of the day, we have to all be responsible for our own behavior and teach our kids to be respectful and responsible. And again, as we get more and more people here, we all have to do our part to live harmoniously and safely. Well, during COVID, you, uh, the city did its, uh, get a good job with the ambassadors. So, yes. I mean, it's great to have a law, I mean, uh, but I, or a bylaw, but I mean, the sense of using community engagement to kind of raise awareness, I mean, it, it is, it's, I know the city, uh, the colony farms, they have those signs from GBRD, but mm -hmm. it's not, it's not common across the whole region and and you know like you know there's older folks walking those trails so uh, being clipped by something at 40k is not going to be good for your health so is there anything else you want to add I mean before you have a chance to close here I think I just want to say also Coquitlam is a very safe city but going with safety is the perception of safety and I'm really disappointed especially since COVID at the rise of um, anti-racism incidents and people in our community who just don't feel safe. There's been a couple of shootings of, you know, gang members. And, you know, even though on reality, Coquitlam is, is very safe, the perception might not be there for everybody. So I'm really proud that the city of Coquitlam, we heard, we've heard this from the residents. And that's one thing that really keeps me going is listening to the residents. And so we formed a advisory committee all around community safety. And that's where I'm heading off to tonight. I'm the vice chair. And we're, we're listening to residents and different groups out there to try and 
do what we can to proactively provide a safer environment that's um, or, or an actual initiatives, more police on the ground or, you know, I actually, when I came home from a trip, this is slightly different, but when I came home from a trip to the Sunshine Coast, I noticed that there was a whole bunch of publicly accessible automated defibrillators hmm. around there. So I talked to our mayor and I said, why don't we have that? And then, no word of a lie, two weeks later I got an email, we all got an email from St. John's Ambulance. Anyways, it's now coming that we're going to have eight or ten publicly accessible automatic defibrillators put in Coquitlam. And they've been proven to save lives. So that's not quite the same as racism, but I want our citizens to feel safe when they're out in their community, whether it be from speeding bikes or racism, accessibility, being accepted, or if they have a medical incident. So safety is something that's constantly evolving. We have to listen. And I look forward to continuing to do more of that if I'm reelected next month. Well, I want to thank you for coming in. Okay, you thank know, you. Time just flies when you're it does. talking about uh, politics. Uh, so that's Councillor Terry Towner. She is running for re-election at the City of Coquitlam. Uh, if you want to know more about Terry Towner, please reach out to her social media and website. Uh, this is Patrick McCarthy reporting with Tri-Cities Community Television. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Pleasure.